from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. My name is Rob Snowy, and my job is to educate others all about fly fishing. Sometimes in my podcast, it'll be me interviewing someone else. Sometimes it's just me talking. That's going to be the next episode about my crazy weekend at Snakeheads. But in the meantime, we're going to go up to Northern Jersey for episode 270 of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with Stephen Sautner. Stephen is a globe trotting angler, author, and fly tire. He's written for the New York Times and has published three books. In this episode, we'll learn about Stephen's life in the outdoors and how his adventures make it into print. You can find more about Stephen at stephensautner.com and be sure to follow him on Twitter. Coming up on the podcast, those recent encounters with snakeheads and an interview with Art Noglack. Additionally, I'm going to be having some logoed koozies that you can wear around your neck. Those will be up on my Etsy site very soon, where you can also buy custom flies for me right now if your local fly shop is closed. Thank you so much for downloading this episode, and I thoroughly hope you enjoy this episode with Steve. All right, Stephen Sautner, where are we checking in with you this evening? Uh, I am in the suburbs of New Jersey in a town called Scotch Plains. I'm about 25 miles from Manhattan. So I am in a New York City suburb. Fantastic. Would that be considered like Northern Jersey? Yeah, it's kind of North Central, I would say. It's not, you know, people from North Jersey, I don't know, people get very uh, particular about their geographic realm of New Jersey. People from, if I said I was from North Jersey, everyone north of me would be like, ah, that's not North Jersey. If I said I was from Central Jersey, et cetera. So let's just say North Central Jersey sounds good. Okay. I mostly know... Bordentown, that's where my cousins were from. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's I call that South Jersey. Yes. But people south of Bordentown might have a problem with that. And but now they're in Hoboken and they've also got a weekend place in Ocean Grove. Oh yeah. Nice down there. That's it's pretty okay. nice. It's classic Jersey Shore. Absolutely. All right. So how do you know Mark Softman? <laughs> uh he's my introduction Mark's... to you. Oh, okay. That's so funny. Mark Softman is my wife's brother-in-law. Okay. So uh, I've known Mark for almost 30 years. When I first learned how to tie a shad fly, and I was I was dating my wife at the time, I showed Mark how to tie it, and then he told me I was tying it off. I was just learning how to tie flies. Shad flies, are, as you know, can be a really simple tie. I was tying it off wrong, and he showed me how to do it right. So I'll be forever grateful. Fantastic. All right. And do you have a celebrity doppelganger for those listening at home who haven't pulled up your website? Yeah, yet? that's an interesting question. I see you ask that quite a bit. I've been told that when I don't, I have a goatee and I've had it for quite a while. When I shave my goatee, I look like George Bush Sr. So, you know, whatever. There was a time when I was a younger man when people said I looked like Matthew Modine, but I think that time has. Well, first of all, I never really believed it. And second of all, that time has long since passed. And you almost have a Hank Azaria voice. Ah. I, I don't know about the impersonations, but if you've ever heard an interview of Hank Azaria. Who is Hank Azaria? I know the name, but who is he? Uh, he, Homer Simpson, maybe? Apu? <laughs> okay. All right, cool. He was on Friends. I watched season one mm -hmm. of Friends before it was kicked off Netflix. He was in mm. that. Okay. I'm trying to think of what else Hank Azaria has been in. Yeah, I know the name for sure, but uh, I'll have to hear his voice and see if okay. I sound like it. So are you a native Jersey boy? Born in New York City. Where lived the city? In, yeah, lived in Rockaway Beach, New York, which is Queens, until I was in first grade. And then my parents moved us to the suburbs. And I've basically been in the same area ever since. So that goes back. Oof, wow more than 40 years and did you so i've been a jersey boy for most of my life did your family have a history of fishing i know you know my parents are both new yorkers and my dad grew up fishing 
somewhere around the Bronx. There's pictures uh-huh. of my grandpa. They, they would go carp fishing. Nice. No. As a matter of fact, I am completely self-taught. Um, no one in my family fishes. I didn't have, like, the fishing uncle who would take me under his wing and teach me stuff. You know, I was hardwired to fish, and I don't know why. You know, who knows why people pursue passions. But I know when I was a kid, you know, I've sort of thought about this. Oh, where did I get this? When I was a little kid, whenever we went to any sort of body of water, you know, a lake, a pier, whatever, I needed to look in that water and see what was in there. If there was someone there with a rod and a pail, oh, my God, I had to look in that pail and see what was in there. I was just fascinated by it. And I really didn't start fishing until relatively late, I guess. I started fishing in high school. I asked my mom and dad for a rod and reel for my birthday, and I got that, and uh, they got me a couple of books, and it just went into pure insanity from that point on, and really have never looked back. And it just gets, it just gets worse. Well, not worse. I mean, it's an endless road of wonder that I'll never reach the end of until, until I'm buried, I guess. Was getting your driver's license a huge impact on your fishing locations? Uh, yeah, I guess it was, but you know, I had found a local pond up the road from my mom and dad's house. That was a secret spot and it was a really good spot for, and I could walk there or I could ride my bike there. It was a really good spot for largemouth, and it had really big crappies in it. Like the biggest crappies I've, I've ever seen. My friend caught a 16 inch crappie there and it was a secret. Like no one knew about this pond. It was about a, I guess about a three acre pond. They had it was a it was a park. They had it was it was uh they had acquired the town had acquired this land and it was a swamp and then they they made it into a pond and they filled it with water and then they stocked it and they didn't really tell anyone about it. I mean the town just sort of did it and I discovered it. I mean I sort well I'm sure I wasn't the only one but it felt like it. Remember I went up there because it just looked good and I brought my rod and I and I I had a little plug a rebel and I caught like a 14 inch bass. I was like oh my god nice. and this was like less than a mile from my parents' house and it was my, my own little fishing preserve. And then that went on for a couple of years and I learned how to bass fish and fish for crappie. And then slowly people found out about it. And I know there's a thing when um, they first build a new pond, there's a productive period, like the first couple of years for whatever reason, because it has submerged vegetation or whatever. It's it's a productive body of water and fish grow very big. And I I was in that, you know, I got to ride that curve the whole time. And and I caught, it's funny, I was just thinking about it, the biggest largemouth bass I ever caught, which was five pounds, which is, you know, big, but not gigantic, was from that pond. I caught that bass. Now, here's the funny thing. I caught that bass on March 20th, 1985. I'll never forget it, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's a long time ago. And every March 20th, at some point, I'm like, oh, that's when I caught that big bass. That's cool. It's my so, bass anniversary. Yeah, that's right. And well, here's the thing. So the way I caught that bass was was cool because I was I, it was like a warm or well, I was the first day of spring, right? March 20th. So it was this warm day. It was this warm kind of windy, unsettled day. And I was catching crappy on every cast. And the rig I used to love was a jig and a bobber. I don't know if you ever crappy fish that way, but it's really effective. And what ha- and a windy day is even better because what happens is the jig suspends, there's the bobber, and like two feet below is this jig. And the wave action makes the jig just go up and down really gently. And then all of a sudden, the bobber, you know, crappier, really light hitters, it just sort of slips under. It's a really beautiful, subtle hit. And then you raise your rod and you got your crappie. Now, these weren't the giant crappies. These were like seven, eight inch crappies. And I was reeling this one in, and I had it right up against the shore. And this huge boil appears behind this crappie. I'm like, oh my God. God, that was enormous. I remember like my first reaction was like, we'll throw the crappy back out there, like rigged up with the jig and see if something eats it. And I did, and the crappy just would swim right back to shore. He's like, I'm not going back out there, you crazy. And I no, 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 you're going back out. And then finally I was like, no, this isn't working. I take the I I re-rig and I had this plug. It was this Bagley's bass plug. And it was the latest thing because like it had this very realistic bass image on it. And I started to cast it and cast it. And maybe like the fifth cast, I was like, oh, I'm snagged. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not snagged. And I landed this legitimate five pound largemouth. And I don't think I ever caught another fish on that plug. And I think I actually still have the plug. 
I've tried it and whatever, and it was just a it was a one hit wonder. So anyway, that was my little private fishing hole. And then you know I didn't fly fish, so I started out like the you know evolution of an angler. I started out you know I'm again self taught, so I started out bait fishing, and then I you know I evolved to lures. That was like the next quantum leap leap, and then I started surf casting, and then I started fishing for stock trout with spinning tackle and bait and things like Uncle Josh trout cheese, which people probably don't remember, which was a little jar of this. It was like pre-power bait. And it was this little jar of stuff that like smelled and felt like dog shit. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I can say that. But anyway, it was lethal. A hatchery trout loved it. And then, you know, when I was in my mid-20s. When you were a kid, did you have a local bait shop or fly shop that you'd procure yes. all your stuff from? and? Save up oh, your quarters yeah. and nickels. Yeah, I sure did. Uh, there was a place in uh, Westfield, which is the next town over from where I am now, and there was a tackle shop there called the Sportsman's Outfitter, and it was the classic local old boys tackle shop. And they were not very friendly, and everyone, you know, you'd walk in, this little kid, you know, walk in, well, tenth grade, whatever, and they everyone, every, you know, all the locals, all the guys, all knew each other, all knew the owner. They'd be talking about, you know. And I remember, and I walk in, just silence. And they all look at me. It was really kind of dumb, you know. And I think back on it, I'm like, that's why. That's maybe one of the reasons why mom and pop shops, some of them have gone away. There was this. I don't know how it is where you are or where you you grew up, but in New Jersey, there was this reputation for like surliness in the local tackle shop, you like know. And the it didn't Jersey just, waitress that you just had the Jersey uh, yeah, waitress, but in the that's fly supposed shop to have some shop. sort of charm to it. And it never really, the charm never, I never could really see the charm in that. But every now and then the guy would tell me some little thing. He'd go, oh yeah, I heard him getting bluefish down at the beach. And that was about as good as it ever went. But yeah, the local tackle shop was there and I'd go in and I was like, golly gee, you know, I want to catch some fish. And, you know, they were never particularly friendly to me. And the shop is gone. Had got new, it got a new owner after that. And that guy was much nicer and whatever. I tried to patronize as much as I could, but it's been gone for I don't know, 20 years or so. So, and the guy fly fish, he had, it was a little shop, but I remember it had a ton of stuff in it. It was really a really well-stocked tackle shop. And I would spend any spare money I had, I'd go in there and buy something, anything. And I guess I bought that lure there that I caught the big bass on. Yeah. So then in my, I guess, early to mid twenties, a friend of mine uh, was selling a fly rod. He got into fishing big time and he went right to fly fishing and then decided he's not into it anymore. And he sold all of his tackle. He was going to sell all of his tackle. And he sold me uh, an Orvis super fine six weight. I think sometimes they call it a foreign fine. And he sold it to me for like 50 bucks. He was I just know. looking to unload it. And I bought a Fluger medalist reel. That's a loud one. Yeah. I learned how to fly cast in my backyard with this lefty cray book that I'd have opened up and it always wanted to shut because it was a paperback, you know, like the spine of it. And I put rocks on it and I'd look down and I go, all right, that's an, and it's, you know, like nowadays, not to sound like the, the cranky old timer, but it's, it's so much easier to learn now through YouTube and whatever. And it was so much harder back then. First of all, I didn't know anyone who was going to teach me how to fly cast. So I had this lefty cray book. I think my parents got me. And I was trying to, you know, reading how to fly cast is really hard as opposed to watching a YouTube video. Yeah, I can't look at illustrations and fly fishermen, the Joe Mahler, they're yeah. great illustrations, but I need it to be three dimensional in front of me. I know. I mean, your brain, I think, starts to atrophy after a while and doesn't and you can't do that stuff anymore. Like, do you remember? Um, did you grow up uh, reading the Eric? What is it? Eric Leiser fly fly tying book. That was like the fly tying book. Do you know that one? I'm maybe I have to go check. I've got one. Okay. That's I mean, like it came out in, bound. No, 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 it's not that one. It's a hardcover book. Um, it was the fly tying book. You know, it's God, it was published probably mid 70s. And uh, describing the, you know, reading how to do the pinch method is it's really hard to get what he's talking about. You know, which is such a simple thing. You know, you could go on a YouTube video and you learn it in 10 seconds. That's it was a like question for art next week is the pinch method. I have that in my notes for art next week. The pinch art. technique. Art oh. is the fishing manager of the Orvis Arlington. And we're doing monthly podcasts during quarantine about a certain subject. Oh, and This okay. will be the streamer. Oh, podcast. nice. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, so, you know, learning how to fly tie by reading an Eric Leiser book and, and you know, like three pages to describe the, the pinch method. And don't even think about like a whip finishing. At that point, I, um, I took a fly tying course that another local shop um, was giving. And then I learned all the basics. And that was an amazing experience. But back to the fly rod. So I, I buy the fly rod off my friends. I learn the basics of fly casting. I do a float trip on the Delaware River, the upper Delaware, you know, the upper Delaware. First introduction and, to the Delaware? No, I had fished it before. I mean, I fished for shad in the lower part of the Delaware. I knew very well. It was the, uh, I don't know, second or third time I'd done the upper river. I think the first time I brought a spinning rod and worms. <laughs> and, uh, and then I bought, I'd since bought the fly rod, so I was kind of ready to go. And a friend of mine, I had finally met, you know, that, that, um, uh, mentor, uh, an older guy who who knew, you know, was a, he worked for an Orvis shop and all this stuff. And he told me, you got to go to D Deddy's Fly Shop. He's like, you're going up to the, you going to, the, to to camp on that river. Go to Deddy's Fly Shop first. Use my name, you know, all this stuff. And they knew the guy and whatever. And I said, I'm going on this float trip. And she picked out all these flies, and uh, it was Mary Deddy. In fact, the Winnie was still alive. You know, uh, she was in the back in a wheelchair. I remember she was telling, you know, on oxygen, you know, and she's like, oh, we almost lost mom last week. I mean, you know, that was like, that's, Historical. yeah, exactly. I didn't even know. I was like, who's Winnie? I don't know. And, you want to tell and, the uh, listeners a brief uh, history of them? Oh, the Deddies? Sure. I mean, they are the seminal Catskill fly tires. The, 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 they were the Deddies and the Darbies. And you know, they started tying flies in probably like the late twenties, you know, and the, the Deddy's fly shop is still open. And I think it's being managed by, you know, the great grandson or something like that. I'm not even sure, but you know, the Deddy's shop is still, it's not out of the house anymore. It's actually, they actually have a, a, a fly shop. The Darby's are, you know, all these guys have since long since passed. I mean, the, the, the Darby's I think died in the early eighties. I'm not even sure. But, you know, there's books about them and, you know, that sort of golden age of fly fishing that's, you know, sparse gray hackle and all those guys wrote about in the 40s and 50s, um, I guess, in, in the 60s, too. You know, the Deddies and the Darbies all, all play into this stuff. So anyway, Mary Deddy gives me my little cup of flies and I launch my canoe and I camp on this island on the river. I'm like hanging out i'm unpacking and i i had a spinning rod with me and i wasn't even thinking i was like yeah maybe i'll fly fish i don't even know or maybe i'll just like cast spinners you know with my fly rod i'm with my with my spinning rod and i remember like sitting down and having a beer you know i'm like i 25 i don't know something like that and i remember hearing this the splashing this little squish squish you know, what is that? And I was thinking, like, are there like acorns falling off a tree in the river? I don't know. And I look and I see these these splashes on the water. And you know, I didn't know anything about this stuff. And I was kind of like, but I, you know, I read field and stream and stuff. And so I was like, I think that's trout rising, I believe. I think that's what they call that. And then I was like, oh, I'm gonna go down and fish for him. And I almost went down with the spinning rod. I said, no, 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 no. You've got these daddy's flies, you're gonna string up this fly rod and by god you're going to use it and so i did and i wade out into the river and sure enough there are trout rising and there are bugs trickling off the river and i remember and i think it's so funny because like i mean this was almost 30 years ago and i think if i think hard enough i'm like there i am transported back i can smell the river i know i know could feel the water tugging on my waders i mean I am there. It was such a seminal experience for me. So, you know, these flies are trickling off and I tie on a fly and I start casting it, you know, and now all of a sudden, like the backyard casting is sort of coming into play. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, it's making sense. And then the fly is landing on the water and I see the bug and I'm like, that does not quite right, you know, and, and I catch a bug and, and, and I look at my little cup and I'm like, like, I think this is called matching the hatch. I've read about this and I, I see this little yellow fly and I, I think, I, I'm not positive what was coming off the, the river, but I, for some reason I think it was, a, it was a, a, a yellow sally, which is the little stone fly. I think that's what they were coming up to. Which is weird because I think it's like I've never seen trout rise to a yellow sally since then. But whatever, even if I'm not remembering it right, 
I believe the fly I used was a yellow Sally because it matched what I saw. And I make the cast, or I make a cast, and the fly lands. I'm like, oh, that looks good. That looks like the fly that's coming off. And meanwhile, these trout are still coming up. And it was like this sort of swift run. It was not like flat water, and it wasn't a riffle. It was just this sort of like thigh deep run. And there's this one trout that's like coming up underneath this overhanging branch, right? And I was like, that's my target. And it was probably like 30 feet away. And again, I think back on this and it was a long time ago and I'm there. And I, and I remember that cast, that final cast. I remember the way the line unfurls and the leader and it touches down ahead of the trout and it floats. And then the trout comes up and I set the hook and I'd hooked like a 16 inch rainbow. One of the, like the crazy, you know, steroid filled, whatever you want to call it. You know, those Delaware rainbows, the upper Delaware rainbows, fight like no other i've caught rainbow trout in alaska and all over the place and something i don't know if it's something in the water or whatever those rainbow trout are freaking demons and this thing went nuts just the way they they do there and it jumped and it ran and it jumped and i it was like i was completely out of my league with trying to and i remember the, the that orbis superfine the way it just like sprung to this it it had this life force that i never knew it had i was like oh my god and and then the fish broke off. It broke Ew. me off. It sucked. And I remember just standing, but but it, and it was gone. And that was it. It was gone. And but I remember like standing there in the river, like, oh my gosh. And I remember saying to myself, like, that's it. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm. This is this is what I'm gonna do forevermore. And I, I have. And that's when you know I still. I need to say this. I still spin fish. I I ice fish. I don't really bait fish. But whatever, but you know, a, a casting a fly rod on the upper on, on the upper in the cat skills, I should just say in the cat skills, dry fly fishing, that's the best. It doesn't get better than that. And this time of year, it's the greatest thing a human can do, as far as I'm concerned. So that's how it all started. That's how the madness of fly fishing all started. And I really never looked back. And now I'm in my little tackle room here and I'm looking at, you know. 20 fly rods and my fly tying desk and you know a bunch of books and bookcases of crap and uh, i hope it's cleaner than mine right now i did uh I 11 know. dozen buggers oh my god this, i this think morning, uh, i might be then there's <laughs> just chunks of marabou everywhere yeah i don't have that hey do you have a moth problem if so how do i get rid of it uh it's called blue ice maybe yeah well full freeze everything anything you got throw it in the freezer wow it's a lot of stuff yeah, and then <laughs> basically mothballs. Okay, well, I do the mothballs. Yeah, um, naphthalene. It's what my house yeah. smelled like in senior year of college in entomology class. My roommates hated it. Yeah, well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. But and luckily, we yeah. never, I've never had anything. And, you know, like I, other podcasts, my wife's thinking about getting a dog. I'm like, that dog, if it ever gets into my office, my old dog <laughs> never bothered anything. Yeah. I'm like, that's going to change my life. Yeah, they like to chew and roll and do stuff i did yeah you know, i have a cabin in hancock new york which is near the east branch of the delaware and i wrote a book about my cabin but anyway we'll get, um, we'll get there in a moment yeah but uh i had a i had a dry fly cape in a drawer and i had a mouse build a beautiful nest out of that cape <laughs> i opened it up and i was like what the hell is and then i looked and i saw what are those pink things squirming in it and it would mouse babies it was <laughs> Tucker Carlson has mice that live in his wading shoes. Hmm. He's a fisherman? Yeah. We see him on the river. Wow. Okay. I was going to say tell him I said hi, but I don't know. <laughs> well, let's skip into the writing now. At, yeah. At what point were you able to put those words about fishing onto paper and then potentially get a buck for it? So I wrote my first published story when i was 20 a magazine called the fisherman and which is still around you know it's like the local i think there's like three or four editions of them there's the new jersey fisherman the new york one i think there's still a new england one i don't know there might have been another one like the mid-atlantic one i'm not sure but have you ever seen it it's like on like news newsprint paper print yeah yeah it's that's it um, i wrote a story about fishing for striped bass in new york harbor which Back then was a huge deal because stripers were at their all. This is in the early '80s. Stripers were in their at their all-time low, 
and everyone was looking like, where are the stripers? And I had a buddy who told me like about this. There was a pier in Jersey City in the Hudson, this broken down ammunition pier that had long uh, been closed. And uh, he took me out there and he taught me how to so I caught my first striper. And I wrote an article about that and I sold it. And I think I got like 50 bucks for it. I was so proud of that. Oh, my God. I'm not a prolific writer. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how many articles I've written, but not that many. I mean, I write when I really feel like I want to write about something. I mean, that led to writing for the New York Times, which was really cool, which, you know, I just did as a freelancer. I wasn't a staff member or anything. And I did that for about 15 years. And I just I was a contributor to their outdoors column, along with a bunch of other guys. Um, and I mean, the way that happened is I just I wrote a story about um, fishing off a jetty in New Jersey for kingfish, uh, which are these little like bottom mm -hmm. fish that, you know, and they're really good to eat. And I was that was bait fishing. I mean, I will bait fish if I have to. And it was really fun. It's like this very old timey kind of fishing. And that's what I tried to capture in the story. I just like wrote it and I said, I'm going to send this in. And I had, I, I forget how it happened. I, you know, I may have known the name of an editor. I asked a friend who had had some stories in the times and the editor, this woman named Susan Adams, uh, she called me or I don't even remember. And just said, we're going to run your story. I was like, Oh my God. And it was again, God, the New York Times. I was so proud of that. I would. I'm still extremely proud of, uh, you know, the stories I wrote for, for the Times. That was great. And and she was such a good editor. And I would basically just like I I'd pitch anything to her. She'd be like, okay, that sounds lovely. And I'd be like, I'm gonna go uh, ice fishing for perch. I want to write a story. That's lovely. I'm going steelheading. Like Did here's for, here's the bus money. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, uh, wait, what? Did they pay me? Is that what you asked? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, bus money to get there, or travel expenses. Uh, they paid. I went to Guatemala once to do a sailfish story. They were like, "Oh, submit the expenses," and so I submitted the expenses for the entire trip, which was like thousands. And they freaked out. They're like, "Oh, what?" And they're like, well, "No," and they gave me a couple hundred bucks. Whatever. I was going there anyway. I mean, I, you know, I never like played the game where I would like dangle that in front of someone. Hey, give me a free trip and maybe I'll get you in the New York times. I never wanted, I never did that. I never wanted to feel obligated to write about anyone. You know, I never wanted to feel like if it was a crappy trip, I don't, so I wouldn't really even mention that. And then if I, if I had a good trip, I would write about it. And if it wasn't such a good trip, I didn't write about it. I remember I did a trip to Alaska a long time ago. I didn't get along with the guide. This would actually be a really good story I should write someday. This was the guide who liked to fish. I don't know if you ever had one of those, which I think is just wrong on so many levels. And I think what the deal was, the clients this guy was used to taking out just wanted to get fish in the cooler, and they wanted to take a lot of fish home. You know, there's a mentality in Alaska where you know there's a, there's a certain group of guys who want to go and come back with as many salmon fillets as they could possibly carry on a plane. I think this lodge where I fished out of, that was their clientele. It was not a catch and release kind of clientele. But I think this guy, I'm cutting him some slack here, that was what he was used to. And I, I wasn't into that at all. I mean, I think at the, the very last day of the trip, I kept like one or two silver salmon and brought them home and that was it. But I remember we went out in the boat and and he starts fishing and I was like, this is uncomfortable. And then he we're in this big river and every now and then the silvers would come up and roll. And if you got a cast off into that where the fish came up, you had a good chance of hooking him. And I'm I'm about to make my cast and he beats me to the cast and hooks the salmon. And then he turns to me and he's like, hey, you want to reel this one in? I was so pissed. And like, I'm not like a confrontational cool. guy. I was so not cool. It was the first day of five days with this dude. And so I really wanted to say, I really wanted to just like push him into the water <laughs> and then just, you know, say, no, I don't want to reel him. But I didn't. I just said no. And I, I tried to make it really clear that that wasn't cool. And and then it went on and, and you know, the trip was OK. I really I've been to Alaska. It's been a long time, but I, I went five years in a row. And that was my first and by far least favorite trip because I just didn't didn't like the guy. But anyway, so the the point of that, we were talking about the New York Times. He knew I was a writer for, for the Times, and I did feel obligated to 
to mention. He, he did cut me some sort of deal, but that was not a condition of the trip. But I know he was like, well, you know, by the way, um, you're getting a discount. And so I mentioned him, but in like just just in the most basic way and whatever. But but back to the times, most of the time I just would, you know, some something cool would happen. I'd go fishing and something cool would happen and I'd write about it and I would it'd come out, which was it was a great run. And then she retired and they got a new editor and, you know, the whole thing changed at that point. You know, think about it like 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, most newspapers, which, you know, now who reads those had a rod and gun column or an outdoors column. And, you know, now like none of them do. Right. Who was the guy at the Washington Post Angus for so many years? Phillips. He was a great writer. Yes. He really was. And I read his stuff. Sometimes people would say, oh, you read this in the Washington Post, you know? And yeah, I mean, that's just like a bygone era. And so I caught the very tail end of that. So the new editor came in and he wasn't interested in anything anyone did. And the, the column, every now and then, there'll be some something that they call outdoors. And it's usually some weird extreme fishing, not so usual. on the precipice. <laughs> Yeah, stuff like that. What was um, that article they had last year? Oh God, fishing's oh, new yeah. bird watching. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, and with all these like very hip looking people um, on a fishing lodge, and uh, which you know, I, I'm not gonna. I, I remember reading the comments on that, and people were really like teeing off on it. It's fine, you know, whatever. I, there, there will always be these phases where all of a sudden fly fishing gets hip, and then. And then, like a couple of years later, there'll be some really nice tackle on eBay for cheap, you know. So I don't know. I don't the the whole poser fly fisherman thing. I always love when people come up to you like, "Oh, hey, uh, I want to learn how to fly fish," and you know, someone at like a party or something. And um, and I always say like, "Oh, well, do do you fish?" And and if and they're it's almost always like, "No," and it's sort of like I always think of that. It's like like I want to learn how to like like ski from a helicopter, but I've never skied before. It's like, well, yeah, we're like, well, like get on the bunny slope, you know, learn how to ski, go from the green to the blue and the black. And then in like six or seven years, come back to me and I'll teach you how to freaking fly fish. Now I'm not nasty like that, but, but never has that ever panned out where that person's like, I really want to learn how to fly fish. And like, I'll call you. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. You're like, this dude is never going to call me. And it's probably for the best. And whatever, it's 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 all good. Yeah, man. How uh, how'd you end up in the Falcon Islands? I, I've never talked to anybody yeah. that's ever been there for any reason. Yeah. The last I heard of it was watching The Crown. Oh, The Crown. What are they talking about? The Falklands War or something? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so my day job is at the Wildlife Conservation Society, which runs the Bronx Zoo, and you know the it's Cobra. A... <laughs> Got a yeah. Twitter feed. I know the Cobra. We've got conservation projects all over the world, right? And every now and then, so I'm in the press office. So I, I deal with the media and pitch stories. And and there were, a long time ago, we had acquired two of the Falkland Islands from a, from a donor who was a bird lover. And he acquired the islands. I mean, this guy was a wealthy dude. And, and then after a while, he's like, what am I going to do with these? I mean, the Falklands are incredibly remote for those of you who don't know southern end of south america so guano yeah well there it's like a lot of like sheep country you know it's a it's it's a it's, it's a british too, right yes yep it's a commonwealth i'm not sure what it like the british owned it i still own it and there was a conflict with argentina back in the early 80s and margaret thatcher that's kind of what like made her so popular among some people was because she was like very strong and the and the british came back and beat back those bad argentines and whatever so anyway this donor gives us these two islands we were going to make a big media announcement and we had to go down there and get footage of the islands and so i got to go and it was like i'd been to some cool places through work yeah, you know, I've been to Cuba. I've been to the Amazon. Uh, I've been to the Congo. You know, but the Falklands will always be like the highlight of all of that because, it, like, first of all, we went there by RAF helicopter, which was just badass. And they dropped us off and like, see you in three days. And we camped uh, myself and four other scientists 
of which I'm not. It was this island of tame birds. It has the largest albatross colony in the world. It's a big bird. I've seen them. Big bird. It's uh, has six a plus feet, six foot plus wingspan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Every bit of it. I mean, it might even be eight feet. Um, the black-browed albatross, which is not the real giant one. I think the real giant one is the wandering albatross, but I think it has a 12-foot wingspan, which is just, like, hard to even imagine. Yeah, the it's one in the Galapagos, they look like boat propellers. Yeah, I mean, they are. So anyway, we were there during the height of breeding season, and I, there were, I forget, 150,000 pairs that wow. nest on this one island. And uh, we're like, okay, you know, we set up camp, like, let's go see the albatross colony. We start walking, and then like, we come over this, we start hearing it. It's like, and we come over this rise, and it's just like, it's just the most mind-blowing thing you ever saw. 150,000 pair of albatross doing their thing. And they're absolutely tame. You walk right in among them, and they're just kind of like, "Oh, hey, how's it going? Where, what are you?" And I and couldn't get so, over that in the Galapagos that you're walking down a trail, and the yeah. birds are like, "Excuse me," and yeah. they're just nesting right in the middle. Like, yeah, you can go that way. <laughs> yes, right. And so there were albatross, and there were penguins. Uh, there were three different species of penguin that that bright. were nesting. There were rockhopper penguins. And there were Gentoo penguins, and there were Magellanic penguins. There was another bird called a tussock bird, which looks like a cat bird, except it was so tame. It would just like, it literally land on your head. Just like, oh, hey, how's it going? Our cat You're bird like, just Whoa. peeped on our neighbor during the, the little social get together on the Oh, highway. really? <laughs> What's in cat bird puke, huh? They're, they're bug eaters, so yeah. My but anyway. in college would feed hers raisins, and it would fly, like you said, tame. It would fly right up to her, almost her hand. They wow. always had a big box of raisins by the back door. Oh my god! The garage, and it would just fly up and eat raisins out of their hand. I love cat birds. I think they're cool birds. But anyway, so we camped on those islands for three days. And one of the funny things about that was um, that we were we didn't know this when we set up our camp. Um, we were in this like tall grass. And we were between the haul out and this Gen 2 penguin colony, not a big colony, like a couple of hundred birds. And so we would be sitting around like after the work day, quote unquote, was done. We'd be sitting around. And all of a sudden we hear this rustling in the grass and 10 penguins would just come running past and their little feet, their flipper feet would just go like, I don't know if you can it's hear it. It's a funny like, sound. I, yeah, I've heard it on wet sand and it is one of the most comical sounds of theirs. It's like watching conductors for an opera walking in wet sand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. With, and like they come a zipping past. Shoe. They come zipping. Oh, look, there go the penguins, and back and forth, and back and forth. And then the one funny story about this whole thing is, uh, so we were with the former president of the Bronx Zoo, this guy named Bill Conway, who's a you know very well known ornithologist, whatever, and he's this distinguished guy, and brilliant, and and a great guy. He's like, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to sleep. And he, and he went off to go to his tent and he's gone. And then he comes back like a minute or so later and he's like, seem to have a problem. We're like, well, what's wrong, Bill? And he goes, there's a penguin stuck in my tent. <laughs> and somehow this penguin got, and there was no, there were no biting insects. There was no reason to keep your tent zipped up. But apparently there was because this Gen 2 penguin ran into his tent and couldn't get out. It was just running round and round. <laughs> in his wow. tent and he's like can you guys help me get the penguin out of my tent and i'm like god this is just surreal it's like a marx brothers sketch I've and been bitten by one man you gotta be careful oh wow okay well when were you bitten by a penguin not a lot of people can boulders Beach, claim. south africa oh wow the one okay. that so fed you... raisins to the cat bird was also obsessed with penguins so i was getting close-ups with the macro oh lines. very cool yeah, so so you know penguins so yeah, yeah we weren't smelly bit, creatures too oh Oh well, that guano smell—it's a guano sort of and strong just regurgitation of yeah. Well, they so they that. feed their young, yeah. But anyway, we got the penguin out of the tent, and it was like full of penguin guano, and uh, we're like, good night, and we let he had to clean out his tent. But whatever. But the Falklands is also uh, has a great uh, sea run brown uh, population. They were introduced by the British back in the 30s or 40s or whatever. So not on the islands that WCS owns now, but on the main – so the Falklands are basically there's, – there's two main islands. There's, I think it's east and west. I don't remember. And I was on the east where a lot of the battles were fought during that war. And I did go off sea trout fishing uh, for one day, which was great. You know, Some of the, the stuff that I've done, the remote 
fishing I've done has been completely unguided, which is like audacious, I guess, to say like, how are you gonna you gonna go like catch sea trout on the Falkland Islands without a guide? Like, how are you gonna do that? I'm like, I don't know. So, you know, I found a book. Some guy wrote a book about fishing in the Falklands and oh, that's maybe sold. That's yeah, I know exactly. Exactly. And um, but he he named <laughs> some streams, bodies. and sh- sure enough, there was a stream right outside the capital city of city town of Stanley. And I got a taxi and he took me to the dead end road. And then he's like, okay, you go over that ridge and you know, you walk about two or three miles and there's a river there. And I remember like walking over this ridge and, and, uh, walking past a a bomb crater, which is, you know, you don't do that every day. Oh. And then the guy told me, he's like, okay, you know, you kind of, you're going to come to the taxi guy. They're going to come to this river. No, I'm sorry. It wasn't a taxi guy. There was a farmer there with a taxi dropped me off. And I asked him, and he's like, you go over this ridge and you keep going. And he's like, but you're going to see a fence. Don't go past that fence. I was like, oh, why? Is it private? He's like, no, it's a minefield. Oh. Wait, well, okay, I won't go past that fence, man. No problem. So there I was. It was so cool because we were, you know, I had like this free afternoon and, and you know, I had hours to kill. And I'm like walking through the tussock grass and the windswept Falkland Islands with not a human around for miles heading toward this river I know nothing about to supposedly fish for sea run browns and and I caught them they weren't big I think the biggest one was 18 inches but whatever they were I was the only no, I'm so, I started to think I went to fish Tierra de Fuego I caught a larger sea run brown but whatever just not to be able to say no. that you've been to the Falkland Islands and caught a fish I caught a fish now here's the but so here's the thing the sea trout were awesome right but there's this other fish native to the Falkland Islands called the Falkland mullet, right? Which just doesn't sound like all that great, you know, just mullet. Is that whatever. The, the, the baseball team to the Falkland mullets down there? Yeah. The cricket team. <laughs> yeah, the cricket team, I guess. It looks like a, it, the closest thing it looks like is a redfish, but it doesn't really look that much like a redfish. It's kind of this dark gonna, brown, but it's Google basic. this while you're talking. Yeah, it's the basic shape of a redfish. They get to be about 20 pounds. They come into the shallows, I mean, like really shallow water, and they push awake, and you can sight cast for them, and they'll hit flies. And so I remember the very first cast I made in the Falklands, in this river, I had a follow, and I was a, I wound up catching it. I think the next cast it took, it was like a pound and a half Falklands mullet. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then um, I caught a bigger one, and it was like, I don't know, three and a half pounds. But here's the thing that was so cool about it. like it looks like a redfish, you know. It's, it's like a the... walleye, redfish, corbina. I, yeah, it I, do... that's a weird looking fish. It doesn't quite that's Cod just it. esque with the double f- And the pectorals are really long like a jack. I don't know if you could see that. It's yeah, got those it's really a weird long pe- fish. It's kind of like uh, uh, you know, a combination of all these different fish, but mostly it's because it has the mouth, the underslung mouth of a redfish. But the cool part was I remember hooking this three and a half pounder, whatever it was, take some line. And at the end of the run, it jumped. And it just seems like the most unlikely fish that should jump. And it did. And it jumped. I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. So I caught a bunch of those. And I was like, damn, they were fun. And, you know, some, you know, catching a sea trout is cool. Of course it is, whatever. But something about, like, the native fish that, like, no one catches was really cool. And then... That night, there was, you know, it, there, are, there are pubs there in Stanley. I went to the to the local pub, and they had mullet on the menu. I'm like, oh, God, yes. I remember I had a mullet, like broiled mullet and a Guinness, because, you know, it's British and whatever. And, God, it was good. And I'm like, and I remember thinking to myself, like, man, if this was a fish they had back home, like in the Northeast, everyone would want to catch these fish, because they, they come into the shallows. You can fly fish for them. They jump, and they're delicious. and but you got to go to the Falkland Islands to catch them. Speaking of and southern fish, Argentina, oh, yeah. You like to eat the shad, which I, get, I gather is legal where you are. Yes. Oh, it's not where you are. No, you can't take any of the the herring or shad. You can take all the gizzard shad you want. Oh god, not that. Which shad. I someone told me they're good to eat, but I the can't Koreans, do that. The Koreans, you can get them at uh, at the Korean grocery stores down the street. Uh, I'm not there yet. Google gizzard shad. It's Korean dishes. Wow. Whereas okay. I don't want to touch one. 
even well, with gloves on now. Oh, they're smelly. God, yeah. they're smelly. They're they're like my least favorite. We'll, I have to we'll admit, get into them even... tomorrow. We'll probably foul hook a dozen where we're going. Oh God, I would do like <sighs> that. That's the worst. Oh, that's the worst. And there's, I, do you, are they gigantic where you are? I mean, you get some like, some ones you gotta fight on the reel. Yeah, there's slabs. They're these like two and a half pound slabs of whatever. Steak. But it's like trash juice smelling. Oh, yeah they're not like dumpster well juice. maybe they're delicious i don't know uh, but uh i'm not again i'm not there but yeah american shad i love eating american shad and i hate that stupid joke that you hear the old timers oh you put them on a plank and then you eat the plank ah if i hear that one more time i'm gonna i don't know what i'm gonna do but hate that and um their name but, translates to the most delicious fish it was and named that the for most a delicious reason. Sub- the most delicious of herrings, Alasa sapidissima. They are really good to eat, but there's a couple of things like any other fish, you got to take care of it. And so step one, you got to bleed it immediately, which is easy. You reach in, grab the gill, give it a yank. Blood is all over the place. And it dispatches the fish humanely. As far as I'm concerned, the fish is dead pretty quickly after you yank its gills out. Then you got to put it on ice. And, and then the other thing about Chad is, um, you know, when they first come in to spawn, they're full of fat, and that's the best time, right? It's like in salmon, you know, and but when they come in, it's like a fuse has been lit, and they're burning through that fat. So you want to get that shad as early as you can. So if I catch a shad in like early April, and it's a cold day, and I bled it out, and I remember to bring a cooler, and actually, if I'm going to bring – what's the other thing? If I'm going to keep shad, I bring a cooler with me. And and with ice or freeze packs or whatever, that's what I do. I mean, I'm like, uh, uh, I've got to take care of and honor this fish, you know, and I'm going to eat it right and all that. So, you know, I don't know if you read John McPhee's book, Founding Fish. Yep. Actually, there's one. I have two copies. One is. It's so funny. I have two copies, yeah, too. One, I don't I, know where I got When the I see one. them at the thrift store, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it <laughs> in case somebody, you know, I talk to like the neighbor. My neighbor, right. Brendan, borrows all my books. Okay. So I always just have extra. I'm like, you know, that's a dollar fifty. Yeah. I'm gonna get it, and someone will want to borrow it. He's such a good writer, man. I mean, he's just dominance you know. of nature was was pretty fascinating with Los Angeles. Oh, I didn't read that. Yeah, what Iceland is that? putting out no. fires with water. Wow. Okay. Don't know that. Okay. I haven't read the full McPhee catalog, obviously. But anyway, founding fish in the back of the book there's all these different ways to cook shad and shad row and milt which i haven't done yet his method for cooking shad is so simple it's just broil it for 15 and a half minutes with lemon pepper on it done (laughs) it's that's it you know if you catch them early in the season they just self-based in their own there's no you don't put butter or anything on it none of that it just when you pull it out it's just oil just bubbling all around it as if you basted it and then it's the challenge of eating it you know and shad are incredibly bony but to me it's like it's weird it's like part of the charm is like all these freaking crazy y bones and and after a while you can learn how to eat around the bones if you start on the edge and work your way then it's sort of you can layer it and you you know every now and then you're gonna get up some piece and be like oh my god and just spit it out because it's just riddled but it's a really delicious fish if you if you catch them early when they're full of fat you bleed them and you ice them and take care of them. And then, you know, you could tell when you've done it right because when you take it home and fillet it, quote unquote, because filleting, it's, is, you know, your fillet has probably 300 bones in it still. It's very firm. And if you don't treat them right, it's it's mushy. And you can tell, you're like, so I, I um, think the Algonquian name for them was inside out porcupine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. That's cool. And there's some sort of like shad poem about like the devil and, yeah. you know, I forget. Did, did I think ever- I tweet it. Do you ever gut one just to see if there were anything in its stomach? No, I never have, but I've often wondered. So let's just say your fly was a little chartreuse critter swimming through the water instead of a fly. And that shad swam up and ate it or whatever, put it in its mouth. And it was, it wasn't a fly, but it was a chartreuse critter. What would happen next? Would the shad just spit it out or would the shad eat it? I'm very curious about that, you know? Like, I don't know. I mean, like, why do they chase this stuff down? And, and you know, and they chase it down. You've seen it. It's, and uh, uh, It's things eating their eggs. They're protecting their, their progeny. Plus, they're just all raged up with hormones, too. I guess. Yeah, they're like I guess frat boys it. in bars. 
I suppose, yeah. Like, what is that thing? But have you ever caught them on dries after they spawn? No, so I never heard about that until I interviewed Joe DeMaldaris. And he's like, you'll oh, get them I on Joe. You'll get them on K Hills up by the dam on the upper Delaware. Yeah, not like, even up by the dam. you got to be kidding me. And I'm like, that's a bucket list thing now is to catch one on a dry. So let me tell you, I've done it. You do one and you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> because they're usually when that happens, it's after they've spawned and they are just skin and bones um they don't fight well i shouldn't say that every now and then you get one that's like a little bit but they fight a little bit but i usually get them by accident when i'm trout fishing and sometimes you know there'll be dozens and dozens of them rising it's always like i shouldn't say always mostly a last light situation Gulping air or they actually no they're they're taking bugs that's weird yeah they're no i mean these are the repeat spawners right so, so these are the there's, fish there's food they gotta fatten up for their trip back down river I mean, that's what the fry eat. Have you ever seen the fry catch oh, midges midair? We catch them. Yeah, we, though they jump out, it looks like rain. Yeah. Down here. Have you ever looked closely? It's a sunny day. I've never seen what they're jumping for. Midges. Okay. Well, let me say, I shouldn't say every time, but one, I remember seeing them in the middle of Delaware, and these, these shad were like two inches maybe, and they kept jumping and jumping and jumping. I'm like, what are they jumping for? There was nothing chasing them. I thought something with like a smallmouth or something. They were just free jumping. And I look, and the the surface of the river is covered in midges, and they're they're they were jumping and catching midges in midair. So that's what they're once they hatch in the Delaware before they run out into saltwater. They they they're insect eaters, Do right? You get them and ever on they, little beet heads because we'll get them on little size fourteen pheasant tails. If you're just going after some bluegills with fry? a dropper, yeah, and, oh, and all I've their scale that. comes off. If their their uh, scales are so fine, they go between uh, your fingerprints. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, and it's like I fine glitter, and you'll, you'll catch them by accident all the time. Oh, I've never done that. That sounds really interesting, though. I don't know if I want to molest them, but whatever. But anyway, they do. When they're done spawning, the the pool like near again near my my cabin, there's a pool they call the shad pool on the east branch. It fills up with shad, and then and there's a point where they're you know they're done spawning, particularly if it's a cool year, because I think warm water kills them. And uh, that's why, like, on warm, when the river gets really warm, you'll see a lot of dead shad. But if it's a cool spring, they'll linger. And I think that's when you get those repeat spawners that come back as, like, six-pound fish, you know, which I used to see a lot of on the Delaware. Now I hardly ever see fish that big. I'm not sure why. But anyway, they will rise. They're hard to hook because you got to give them a second. Like, they come up. It's weird. It's a really bizarre rise. It's not like a trout. It's like this, you know, they've got that scoop mouth, you know, like a tarpon. And and they, they come up and the, the rise makes a noise. It's like this kissing noise. And that's how you could tell the difference between shad rising and trout rising, though I've been fooled both ways. But for the most like part, it's like, like a yeah, the bluegill make like a distinctive bluegill. kind of smooching yes. sound. It's it's it sounds a little bit like that. And and they take the fly and they're it's funny. They're they're selective, you know, like they, they only want they want small flies. They don't want anything over like a, they want like an 18, whatever. They're not, they're selective with size, not so much with, with pattern, but you know, they come up and then you got to give them a beat and then you come up with some. And oftentimes, even with that, you pull the fly right out of the mouth. And that's how, you know, it's a shad, by the way, if you pull it out of the mouth and then, you know, they surge a little bit for the bottom and whatever. And then they're done because they're like, dude, I just swam 300 miles without anything to eat. I just had sex, and uh, and now this. Come on, so whatever. And then I let him go, and that's the end of it. But bucket list. I was the same way. I was like, oh, that sounds so cool. Get one to try. And then I finally did. I was like, all right, next bucket list item. So you've also been doing some brookie fishing while you quarantine, not just shad fishing. Oh yes, yes. So the one good thing about COVID, and it's the one thing, is there's no traffic. Right, I'm in like traffic hell in New Jersey, as you probably are too. Your jug here. handles? Yeah, I got jug handles. I got everything. Oh. I got circles and jug handles and the whole thing. And so I rarely fish after work, you know, because it's just a big pain. You know, you want to go anywhere. It's like a, you know an hour and a half of like horrible traffic. So just why do that to yourself? Now there's no cars on the road. So plus I'm working from home. So like. Anyway, so I decided to start this like blue line experiment in in New Jersey. You know, I to me New Jersey was always like a joke trout fishing wise and I'd hear people very passionately about like fishing on the the Musconetcong and the big flatbrook and stuff for for stock trout, which I'm 
I'm not really into. If, I mean, if I'm going to smoke some trout, I'll catch some stalkers and whatever. But like as like a real fishing experience, stock trout is just not what I'm into. But the state on their website, they listed all of these wild trout streams. You know, it's like 35 of them. There's probably there are more than that, but there's 35 of them listed. And they did an electro shocking survey, and you could see how many wild trout that came up on these lists. And so I looked at the list and then I got Google Maps and I looked to see what was near my house and or what wasn't or whatever, just which one sounded interesting. And I began just packing my car and driving off into the, I would say hinterlands, but it's not. It's like the suburbs, just a little bit farther out into, you know, like a little bit less suburban, but not that much less suburban. And I have found these like wild brook trout streams that are half an hour from my house, which is just dumbfounding that these exist. And and no one's there. And, you know, the fish are small and it's brush fishing. And I mean, the fishing can be brutal. You know, it could be like you know, walls of multiflora rows that you got to navigate around or whatever, you know. And sometimes I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? But, but and then, every, then every, everything works out. And I, I land like a seven inch brookie and I'm like, oh my God, this is like the native here to here it is the native fish to New Jersey and and it's been really fun and not only you know so there's brook trout and brown trout that's what you're going to find in these streams there's some streams have rainbows but not the ones I've been hitting wild rainbows but there's there's not very many of those and I've had surprisingly good fishing I've caught I caught a brown a couple of weeks ago it was like 15 and a half inches I mean, this is a damn nice fish, you know, no matter where you are. And this isn't a little wild trout stream no one bothers with next to a highway, you know. And this is amazing to me. And the other and, – and no one's there, you know, because, you know, it's – people want to go to the Catskills or they want to go out to Pennsylvania and whatever. I was thinking, you know, this one creek that I fished maybe a month ago. I think it might be a spring creek. I'm not sure. I asked a guy who knows these things and he's like, oh, it's in the limestone area. It could be, but it feels like a spring creek. It's just like serpentine stream. It's full of wild browns. Most of them six or seven inches and extremely skittish, you know? So it's like it and thorns and all the rest. So it's not for everyone. It's not for most, but I wanted to fish it. And I came to this one pool and there was a trout rising in the tail out of the pool. It's a decent sized trout, you know, but you know, decent relative to the stream. And I'm like, oh man, I want to, you know, this is all, it was early in the season and it was, there were caddis coming off and I was like, oh, this is great. I really, I'm going to catch this trout. An hour later, uh, with, you know, half a dozen flies in the willow branches around me, the trout's still rising and I haven't caught it yet. <laughs> I just can't. And, and, it, and I missed it twice and then it's kind of on to me and it's like, Dude, you can throw anything, and I'm not going for it. But keep trying. And after, and I was, you know, I'm on my hands and knees, not I'm squatted down doing this thing. After a while, I'm all cramped up, and I'm like, I can't take this anymore. And I stood up and I spooked the trout. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I think of you. And I spooked it, and I was like, that's it, game over. I went back a week later, and I'm on like my third cast. I the fly hit just right, and there was like a snag. Uh, it was like you know a brush pile and it was the trout i the trip the fish was not coming up but i put a dry right where it should have gone and that fish came up and took the fly and i had him on like oh i got him and it was like maybe it was 11 inches i got a little glimpse of him and he ran into the snag and hung me up and pulled off didn't break off pulled off i remember sitting there just like with my head down like oh my god that was horrible and i'm thinking to myself you know like the only time i felt this bad or i've worked a trout for an hour and never caught it it's on the in the catskills on, on the delaware and everyone's like you know no one wants to bother with these streams but like there is challenging as you know it's a different kind of challenge but it's that same fly fishing challenge that you get on the delaware which is just awesome and they're the 35 minutes from my house so this has been so fun to discover these things and you know i heard um the show you did with uh, your your producer a couple of weeks ago, and he yeah, was talking about Jason. yes, producer Jason. I and and uh, Jason and I have fished some in the same waters. He mentioned one stream. I'm like, oh, I know that stream. And yeah, he's. He, I was like, I can so relate to what this guy's doing. And and you know the thing about these streams, I was thinking about it, and um, it's not big trout that you're going after, even though occasionally you'll, you'll get one, but you don't go there 
like, oh, I really hope I'm going to catch a 15 inch trout because you, you probably won't. It's going to be half that size, if that. What you're getting is solitude, which is so hard to get. You'll never get it on the Delaware. I mean, maybe occasionally you will, or any of the Catskill streams, unless you're, you know, for the most part, you're not getting that. But like, it's so great to go fishing bushwhack in a stream and know, like, I'm not going to see another fisherman because no one's going to be bothering doing this stuff. And that to me, like all of a sudden, like in a seven inch trout, it's like, who cares? It's a wild trout. I don't care how big it is. It's a wild trout and it's no one's here. And it's incredible. And I'm not, I'm not trespassing. These are just like streams that are just like forgotten. You know, no one's, no one's, no one's going to say, you know, there's no one's going out of their way to, to fish for them. And so it's fine. Cool. I'll keep fishing them. When you're fishing spots like that and yeah. Throughout the day, do you have a, a constant running narrative going through your conscious talking yourself of how this would turn out in read, written form? Totally. So I'm a storyteller. Maybe you can tell. I'm always formulating stories in my head, <laughs> constantly formulating stories in my head. In fact, I've written a story about my New Jersey stuff. I, I, I Hopefully you'll see it soon. I have stories coming out in Angler's Journal I've written for American Angler and some other magazines, so we'll see where it winds up. But I did write a story that I, I'm very happy with about this whole experience because it was so fun. It was just so fun. It's like rediscovering. It's like being you know, a kid I was, again. I was it's that giddy. feeling of just going to that pond and catching that bass. Oh, my God. I'd come home and I'd tell my wife. I'd be like – and it was like always – I'm like, and it's – 31 minutes away like oh my god is this like amazing it's like this secret but you know no one i mean people know that you know there's they have their followings like i'm not naming any streams i w wouldn't do that but it's you know a little bit of research you can find out what they are but like you want to go bushwhacking and for a you know a six inch brown that's really hard to catch i mean go for it <laughs> you know it's there's, you'll never get a lot of people on them because it's just like a specialized thing. Everyone wants to go to the Catskills or Pennsylvania or fish for stalkers or whatever. That's cool. You know, there you go. Well, speaking of some of the local spots, what are other distant locations you've been to? You've mentioned so far. Yeah, so Alaska, you know, I went to Cuba. Falcon, yeah, I've been Cuba. to Alaska. You know, that was all, uh, you know, fishing for silvers for the most part. Again, I did a you know, self-guided trip in Alaska to Cordova. You know, at first I did the fishing lodge, which I didn't like because the guide, all he wanted to do was fish. And then I did a float trip, which was friggin' expensive. And the river blew out the, the second day on a seven day float. And so we fished this like muddy river looking for like sloughs where you could occasionally, you could occasionally catch a fish, not for me. And then I went to Cordova, no guide, you know, Cordova is on is south. Uh, it's like the very kind of northern part of that. Um, what do they call it? That like strip of Alaska. I forget what that region is known as. Southeast Alaska, I guess it is. Kind of the northern part before it starts to move more to the west, like near where Anchorage is. It's like I'm going to guess 200 miles southeast from Anchorage, something like that. It's on Prince William Sound. It's one of these fishing villages. You can only get there by plane or by boat, but it has a road system on it, so you can rent a car. And I, I've heard the road system since washed away, so I don't know what's been a while, but there were all these different streams and they're all full of fish and, and you could just go do your own thing. And to me, that's like much more satisfying than a guide. Now that's me personally, nothing against, and I've had some great experiences with guides, but, but, you know, I, I, you know, to me, I get so much more out of it if I'm, if I figure it out on my own, even though I may not catch as many as if I got a guide, but, but Again, having said that, I fish with Joe D. He's awesome. I'll fish with him any day. He's a pleasure. I mean, I, the few times I booked guides and had great times, most of the time I didn't really do very well, but the guide was just a lot of fun to be around. So that's why it was a fun experience, you know? But anyway, yeah, Alaska was great. Um, Cuba was, was a hoot because um, I was there for work. I brought my fly rod just in case. I always bring a pack rod with me, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to fish. And we wound up in the Bay of Pigs, and we wound up in a place called Las Salinas, which is – that's where people – that's one of the places where people go bone fishing. 
The woman who planned the trip for me, a colleague, said, uh, you know, Steve, I, I wrote, there was, each day we had this itinerary and we were very strict about it. And she's like, I put in the, the itinerary for you. You can go bone fishing for two hours. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my God, my I, I love goodness. you. Yeah, exactly. And so there was this research station at the end of this long road. You could like rent a skiff with no motor and this guy would get in the back and, and pull you out onto these flats and go bone fishing. It was cheap. It was like 20 bucks you know, for two hours. It was ridiculous. And I don't know if that was like my special deal or whatever, but whatever it was, we went out and like the bonefish were, well, so the story is, and I, I did write about this in, in one of my books, but whatever. The story is on my second cast, I broke my fly rod. <laughs> It's like, it was just so evil that and that happened. your backup rod was uh, New Jersey? Home. Yeah, that was in New Jersey. It, it's, it is an amazing, so here's the thing. Like, if I didn't break that fly rod, I would have caught like a two and a half pound bonefish. It would have been awesome. But here's what happens. So like, I don't, I'm not sure how I broke the fly rod. I, I might have dinged it. You know, we were using weighted flies, and I might have dinged the blank on a on a bad cast. It was windy, but I remember I pulled out the line, and the knot caught, and it just snapped. And like I lost like two feet of it. So you know, which makes the rod no no more fun to fish with. So I'm like, oh my god, I broke my rod. I'm done. That's it. It's in a second cast, you know. And so like I'd been in Cuba for five or six days. You know, things have rapidly been changing in Cuba, but I learned in Cuba like how the cubans get by with like next to nothing right and and like the old cars you know they keep the old american cars going and they do any crazy thing to keep it running because like no other option you know there's no there's no car dealership or whatever and so and they have this this saying in cuba it's called alo cubano which is like the the cuban way and it's like basically like cubans will get by no matter what you know and they're very proud of it and every now and then i'd hear the cuban song and they go oh alo cubano it's like this this like, I don't know. It's this, this, this credo they're very proud of. Anyway, here I am with the broken rod and I'm like, I'm done. I'm like, and, and, and meanwhile, the guide who spoke very little English spoke some, but not much. He, he like restrings my, he takes the tip, just sort of twists it off, restrings my rod, hands it back to me. He's like fish. I'm like, well, the rod, he's like, he's points. He's like, it's bone fish, fish. And so I'm like, oh, I stand up and I'm like, oh, and I cast it. And now it's like, it's hard, you know, this lovely nine foot eight weight is now like a seven foot 10 weight or whatever it is. And I manage like the world's worst cast, but I, I freaking get the cast off and the fly lands and a bonefish eats the fly and I, and I hook it and I land it on that friggin' broken rod. Right. And I bring it up, and I was like, oh, my – and I haven't caught a lot of bonefish. I mean, that was like I think the second bonefish I ever caught. I caught one other one in Belize years before. And I land that bonefish, and I remember I was looking at it, and the guide, he just says this. He goes, he goes, senor, you catch that fish a lo cubano. And I was like – I almost started crying. I was like, oh, my God, this is beautiful. I did. I did catch a bonefish a la cubano. I could have just sat there and sulked and moved my fish anymore, broken rod. And I landed that bonefish on a freaking broken fly rod. So it was like this amazing experience. I wrote a story about that, but I'll never forget it, you know? And if I just landed it perfectly with the nine foot rod doing its thing, it would have been fun. But having landed it on the broken rod was like this amazing story. So, you know, there you go. Right on. Can you give us a little brief, uh, description of some of the books you've written before we get into the random questions of the evening yeah sure so i've done three books i wrote a book called upriver and downstream actually i edited that book which was like a best of new york times columns for like from like a 10-year period and it's stories by myself and like a bunch of other writers and that book came out in 2007 and then i wrote a book called fish on fish off which is just stories about weird things that happened to me while fishing. And that includes my Falklands adventure and my Cuba adventure and learning how to fish as a kid and getting thrown in by a friend of mine who I, he threw me in the river cause I pissed him off and we were got to read about it, I guess. And you know, it's just a collection of sort of oddball things that happened to me while fishing. And then I wrote a cast in the woods and that book came out in two years ago. And that's about my cabin up in Hancock, 
you know, I'd always wanted a fishing cabin and I bought one in 2003 and I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And we fixed it up. It has a little brookie stream that goes through it, which is amazing. And then all these horrible things happened, <laughs> like, like stuff you'd never plan for. Like we had a 700 year flood that basically destroyed the trout stream. It turned it into like a rock quarry and I restore the stream. You know, I learned how to restore a trout stream because it was literally, li it was like a, a lifeless moonscape of a trout stream after that 700 year flood passed. Now the stream is back and it's got brookies and it's got rainbows that come up from the East Branch and spawn and that's really cool. And then I had the whole fracking thing erupted um, at my cabin. I remember I was seeing like, signs. We went up to a wedding in New York in the Cats yeah. Falls and everyone had no fracking well, yeah, signs well, on their, their lawns. Well, my cabin, I'm on like that frontier of the yes, fracking is awesome signs that you might see. I'm a little bit farther upstate. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote about it and I was very cognizant of neighbors who, you know, it's hard to make a living up there unless you like are a logger or your quarry or whatever. And so they were looking at it like this is another way to, you know, their family farm and no one wants to farm. Then, you know, this is how I'm going to keep my farm. You know, it's, it was a complicated social issue. I felt very strongly that it was a disaster, but I was never going to go up to a neighbor and go, how could you sign a lease? What the hell's the matter with you? I just like entered the public process of fighting something you're against by going to public hearings and writing letters and testifying and all that stuff. And we beat it, which was unbelievable. But, you know, well, now gas and oil is so like, just so low and no one's really interested in that anymore. But I always think like, there are always guys kind of looking around like, some way to exploit the cat skills in some like non-sustainable way. And, you know, it's a struggle because I know, you know, we're seeing this now more, I oh, got, I don't want to say now more than ever. That's the cliche you got to avoid in COVID. But um, anyway, it's a struggle. Local, the local people there are looking for ways to make a living. And, you know, I don't want to be the guy from New Jersey telling them what to do necessarily. So I do get into that in quite, quite a bit of detail about fracking and how we fought it. And the whole time I'm trying to trout fish. I buy this fishing camp, but I do write quite a bit about fishing in it. But I'm trying to trout fish, but there's always these horrible distractions trying, you know, pulling me away from it. But it kind of, you know, it's about like stewardship and what it means to really be a steward. And also how like if if you really want to be a trout fisherman, like a real well and any fly fisherman, you gotta you kind of have to become a steward of the resource, you know? You got to have like some skin in the game or else like stuff goes away, you know? So that's, that's what the book is about. Okay. Dig it. Want to do cool. some random questions now? Hell yeah. Who's got the best sandwich in the, the Jersey area of which you live? Have you had the wow. Jersey sloppy Joe? I don't know the Jersey sloppy. Oh yeah, no, I have. There's a place yeah. in next town over. I'm not a big. I mean, sloppy joes are okay. No, the Jersey but, sloppy um, joe, like the coleslaw, the turkey. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, there's weird because you say sloppy joe, and some people think like barbecued ground beef. That's yeah. one version. Not the manwich. Oh, and then there's goodness. yeah, there's a place in next town over that serves a pretty good one. I like a a really good bacon and egg sandwich. That to me, like with ketchup. Kaiser with ketchup. Roll? Yeah. Or bagel. I'll do, I'll do a sesame bagel, but a Kaiser roll, a good one. That's the hardest part, getting that roll right. Yep. There's a couple of delis around that, you know, if you know where to go, you can get them. That's, that's good stuff. If you could be quarantined with anyone right now, other than your wife, who would it be? <laughs> you. We can talk fishing for hours. Awesome. Drink some Keystone yeah. ice. Yeah, man. Tie some, tie some flies. flies. Yeah. There you go. There's so much Maribou around me right now. Oh my god! <laughs> You're like, what's the name of that actress? Uh, Ph Phyllis Diller. Yeah. She look like her. Oh, okay. well, anyone under like a certain age is gonna be like, well, who the hell is this crotchety old dude talking about? <laughs> who hasn't seen Airplane? That woman thinks she's Phyllis Diller. No, no that was Ethel Merman. Merman. Oh, come on. You'll be swell. Yeah. You'll be great. No, we're talking about the one with the husband named Fang. 
Gonna okay. have the whole world on a plate. What do you carry your gear in, and what sort of gear would you find in there? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. So I know there's like a – the vest is starting to feel old-timey. You know, everyone's got sling packs. Um, I have a friend, a younger guy, who is like kind of my entryway into like what younger people think. And when they fly fish, he's a really good fly fisherman. Uh, he's all about the sling pack. He's like, hey, dude, you got to try the sling pack. But – I don't know. I know my vest. I know where everything is. So that's that. Here's the thing that we'll see. You know, if someone gives me a sling pack, you know, maybe I'll try it. But uh, this year, I tried to condense to one fly box. Now, I went to the fly fishing show in Edison. So this is a sort of a humbling thing. Right you know. before everything. Sh- that's down. right. That's right. So do the author's booth thinking like, oh, man, I'm going to sign all these books and be a celebrity. You don't do that to stroke your ego because (laughs) not a lot of guys go up to you. Uh, Unless you're Joe Humphreys, who I got to meet, and that was so cool. He is the nicest guy. Actually shared the booth with Joe Humphreys. I mean, how freaking cool was that? Um, And he is is the real deal in so many ways. He was such a cool guy. Definite Jedi Um, of fly fishing. Oh my God, that, that bow and arrow cast is, and now that I'm fishing these small streams, I was like, Oh, I should have paid attention more to his presentation. I went to a talk about organizing your fly box and it was by someone who was these guys who were selling something and it was whatever it seemed like a worthwhile product, whatever it was. It was Peter fly, Stitcher, custom. Maybe? It was custom. It was flies custom to like the rivers you fish. Yeah. They're Peter like Stitcher from Denver. Okay, yeah. He gave a great presentation, how to organize your fly box. And he talked about going in rows of of like, um, you know, the stages. So starting with the caddis nymph and working your way along to the emerging caddis and then the egg laying cat. And so I was like, oh, wow, what a great idea. So I can normally I'd have like six fly boxes and I would look really dumb in my vest. I mean, I look kind of dumb anyway, but really bulging with stuff. But I've reduced it down to one box for now as the, we get more hatches, I'm starting to add more things. So that's one thing you'll find in my vest now is this one box that that follows the life cycle of the March Brown. And we're not at March Brown season yet. We're right on the on the cusp of it, but we'll see if it works. If you could have gone on tour with any band on any one of their tours, which one – would it have been and when? Well, I'm a huge Clash fan, you know? That was like the only band that mattered. That was a band that got me through high school. So, and I did play in a band called The Orphans. And then I played in another band called D-U-H, which stands for Duh. We wrote all original songs. And actually we wrote a song, I had a song called Trout in D-U-H, which I think is floating around the internet somewhere. But anyway, The Clash was the coolest band going, so... There you go. You played guitar then in the band? No, I was the lead vocalist. I can't play anything. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me squint and read into my questions here. You know, right before this all happened, I was like, you know, I should probably get a new pair of contact prescriptions done. Yeah. So I'm down to two sets of contacts. Uh Uh-huh. These ones should have been changed a while ago. Yeah. Uh, If you only had... Oh, this is, I I didn't change this one out, but this is pertinent. If you only had one style of pizza with one topping eat for the rest of your life, what would it be? I like the tomato pie, which is like the old fashioned pizza with like um, cubes of mozzarella and a lot of tomato sauce. Not a lot thick, but like a thin layer of tomato sauce. Ladled on and then. Ladled on and smoothed out. And then, and then you put the cube of mozzarella on and it melts into like a round thing. There's a pizzeria the next town over called Sorrento's that does such a good tomato pie. I could almost eat a whole one, an entire one. But You know the worst pizza where you live is still better than the best pizza down here? That's so true. I mean there's a 50-mile um, a radius around New York City, and thankfully I'm in that 50-mile yeah. where you can't go wrong with most. And I there's people across the street from me that order Domino's. I'm like, Ugh. why would you do that? It's just so wrong. It's like fishing for stock trout when you're, you know, there's 50 blue ribbon wild trout streams around, but I don't want to fish for stock. I've always been perplexed when you go to Times Square and all like Applebee's and Chili's are all full. Yeah. Like, this is the city of food. I know. These are people who don't want to take chances in yeah. life, but They're going whatever. to Guy Fieri's restaurant getting donkey sauce. One of the <laughs> yeah. best New York Times articles. 
was when they reviewed his Times Square restaurant. I heard about that. I heard about that. You know, there's another. Uh, um, you ever heard of uh, P- Peter Luger Steakhouse? Yeah, that one was pretty pretty rough. Did you too. read that review? Yes. Oh my god, that was that rough. was. They're apparently feeding people right now. Really? I don't know Good if they're just them. giving mediocre food. But yeah, my wife well, came they... home from work. She's like, "Did you read the Peter Luger article?" And I was like, "Yeah, that was rough." Yeah, it was. But you know what? They they deserved it. It sounded like yeah. they were coasting on their laurels. And, you know, you only do that for so long, so whatever. All right. What's the strangest thing you found while fishing besides a bombed-out crater? You're the first person that we've interviewed that's seen a bomb crater while fishing. Yeah. Well, this is – so this happened not that long ago. I, ne- I never fished a, a squirmy worm. Is that what they call it? The squirmies, like, yes. Squirmies, yeah. And I know there's – like you know, it's like in the, the mop fly realm, but whatever. I have a friend of mine, excellent angler. And he fished with a guide somewhere, and that's what he caught fish on. And he was like, oh, my God, this fly is amazing. So he was trying to explain to me, and he mailed me some. He mailed me the long length of stuff and the hooks, and he told me he wrote out how to assemble one and whatever. I said, all right, I'm going to fish this. So, And he kept saying, it catches everything. That was his line. You know, it's caught, you know, I, I've caught wild trout. I've caught, st- I've caught bluegills on it in places I didn't, trout street, I mean, everything. So I'm like, all right. So I go to this, my friend, take, another friend takes me to this wild trout stream, t- puts me into a tube, and it was his stream, and he puts me into this run. He's like, this is a great run. And, and, and so I'm drifting whatever through it, pheasant tail, and it's not catching. I'm just like, oh, I got that squirmy. I put the squirmy on, and I first drift. I'm like, oh, got weight. And I'm lifting. I'm like, just dead weight. I'm like, what? And I, I landed a dead mouse. Ew. A, not the a dr- DJ. A, a, what? The DJ dead mouse? I don't know that. Is that a fly? No, there's an actual like DJ, and his name is M A U S, but it's with a oh, five yeah. for the yeah. S. <laughs> Man, I'm out of it. But anyway, uh, I landed a drowned mouse, and and I remember uh, I I turned to the guy and I was like, my friend was right. It does catch everything. Yeah. So uh, there's a picture. You know, I I tweet crap, and if you go on my Twitter feed, if you scroll down, you'll see a picture of me holding that mouse, and I'm just I'm laughing my ass off. So that's probably the weirdest thing I ever caught fishing. I had that idea that mice drowned and I took a Dave Whitlock hair mouse and put a bunch mm. of split shot and I bounced it under a bridge in Colorado. Yeah. One of the biggest trout I've ever hooked. Sure. Why I not? I thought I was snagged on the bottom. Yeah. Cool. So How big I came was up it? with, I should make pinky flies because the babies probably <laughs> get out of the nest and fall in and drown. Yeah. And it was just a tail of pink chenille, uh, ultra chenille, like San Juan. And yeah. then just baby pink crosscut rabbit. Right. And I never fished it. No, oh, plenty of time. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, who makes your favorite pair of pants? You're a traveling guy. So you probably rely on some, some sturdy gear. <laughs> you know, I'm still like a traditional, I'm wearing, you know, Levi's right now with a hole in the crotch. I don't know how that happens, but whatever. Beans. <laughs> I guess. So, you know, I do that, but I like the quick dry pants. You know, the, the thing that freaks me out recently are ticks. You know, I really don't. I've had some buddies who got laid out by tick borne illness. I got Lyme disease and wound up in the hospital. So, I don't know. I'm spraying pants with uh, Promethrin and, you know, Hoping for the best. Socks in your pants. Where like yeah, the- and I know they sell these ones that are pre-treated, and apparently they they last for the lifespan of the you know eighty washings or whatever. They may be my new favorite pants if I actually buy them. Nice. All right, I've got a private plane waiting at the airport right now. It's fully gassed. Where are we going right now? It's full of fishing gear. Um, I want to catch more bonefish. Um, I want to catch bonefish unguided on my own terms and i looked into the bahamas before we, um we could go to the seychelles it's a fully gassed private plane oh fully gassed all right i'd go to the south but i wouldn't want to go to a place where it gets boring because the seychelles sounds like so automatic like you'll i don't want to catch 25 bonefish in a day i'd rather catch four really memorable ones you know what i mean i think the worst thing that could ever happen when you fish is it suddenly gets boring you're like oh okay i've caught too many and silver salmon can be like that and you know, that's a weird feeling where you're like, but the thing about that, it's, it's short lived. You might be like over the course of the day, like, okay, I've caught enough. But by the next morning, you're like, oh man, I got to do that again. 
So, and also Atlantic salmon. You know, I've caught one Atlantic salmon in my life and uh, on the Marguerite River. I've hooked a couple other smaller ones, but I want to go to a beautiful place and catch Atlantics on a dry fly. So, I you know Russia whatever you know that's chore or one of those lodges in the in uh, Labrador sounds really cool. Yes. All right, last question before yeah. we let you go for this evening. You've already landed a bonefish on a broken rod and and foul hooked a dead mouse, not the DJ. What's a mm. story you had to have been there to have believed? Ooh, oh boy. Oh God, I've got it. I can't think of it. Uh. I fished uh, the Broadheads Creek in Pennsylvania, which is a funky, really good wild trout stream. I fished next to uh, a clown. <laughs> what? <laughs> so uh, in I came up. Uh, well, it was this wooden cutout clown. Okay. <laughs> it's, it was it was so weird. It was like wedged against this rock. And it was this clown with like balloons. And I don't know what it was for. It was like a sign for something. And it was, you know, four and a half feet tall. Sounds disturbing. It, it was totally disturbing. And, uh, but it was there for like weeks next to this one pool. And I, it was the clown pool. And I, and this was a remote part of the broadheads. It was called the, it's the gorge. You have to hike in. There was no one around and I was fishing it by myself. And, and then, like, the you know, I was fishing there once, and it was getting dark, and I looked at the clown, and I just got completely freaked out. I'm like, go get Daddy! <laughs> it's way across the river. And, of course, the fishing by then was done, too. And I was like, oh, and I had to chill, and I'm like, ugh, that was so creepy. So that was – and then I got high water, and it washed away, and that was the end of the clown. So it's Disturbing someone else downstream. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Maybe it's in the ocean now, disturbing. The Dorado will be underneath it. Yeah, mahi-mahi. You should have yeah. put a tracker on that clown. Yes, all right, Stephen, where can we follow you on Twitter? I'll probably see you there in three hours when I go to bed. Sure. My Twitter feed. But what about your books and articles? Where can we find more information on your writings? Yeah, you can go to uh, stephensautner.com. I've got links. You go to Amazon, I guess, or order it from your local bookseller, which is the preferable thing to do. If you can follow me on Twitter at uh, fishon underscore fish off. Fish on underscore fish off. Damned underscore. Awesome. Song. Someone already had fish on fish off. Damn it. How dare and they've never know. tweeted anything. It makes it really annoying. Yeah. The snow white.com is like car detailing and they've had it since 98. Like new people. <sighs> it's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Twitter's fun though. I, I don't do Instagram or any of the other things, but I, I do like tweeting crap. <laughs> I get a little too political. That's my, my venting. I, the only thing, I mean, I do some, but only if it's directly related to environmental crap, because I don't want to get in a pissing match. And I always wonder when people unfollow me, if it was someone who was like, hey, and they read something, I was like, why is this administration doing this? And that's all. I'll just leave it at that. Come there we on. go. All right, yeah. Steven. Thank you so much for letting us get to know you this evening. It and, was uh, fun. What is your drink, by the way? So if we ever have you down here. I'm, I'm about something. to have a, a, a Blue Point Toasted Lager, which is my new favorite beer, which is a it's brewed out in Long Island. Yeah, it's excellent. the first people to ever name an oyster for where they came from. The Blue oh. Point Oyster was the first. Yeah, Kurlansky. Oh, that's right. You had him on. Dude, that, yeah, I just finished paper. You know, the whole book of paper, toilet paper, maybe got two and a half sentences. Wow. I thought that would have a more major impact on humanity. It's like chapters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm about to have one of those blue points, so nice. yeah. All right, I'm gonna go have a Keystone Ice, and uh, maybe go watch the Mozark with the boss. All right, Very see cool. you on the river. Thank you. All right, take, take it care. easy. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.